Hello and welcome. Thanks for joining us this lunchtime. I'm David Wood from the Pacific Science Center and it's my pleasure to be hosting today's uh, virtual Meet a Scientist. Before we meet today's scientists, I'd like to remind everyone that educational programming like this is made possible in part thanks to the generous support of donors. In the face of challenges like COVID-19 and climate change, science and an informed public remain absolutely essential. So to help us ensure that Curiosity never closes, or for more information about donating to the Pacific Science Center, please visit paxi.org forward slash support. So the scientists that we're going to be meeting today are members of Paxi's Science Communication Fellowship Program, which offers training and support for local STEM professionals and connects their work to public audiences. Typically, Science Communication Fellows deliver hands-on activities that's at our Meet a Scientist event, usually twice a month on Saturdays at the Pacific Science Center. Obviously at the moment, our doors are currently closed for obvious reasons, but we still wanted to provide the opportunity to meet some of the fantastic local scientists who have committed themselves to public science communication. Today, our science communication fellows will be discussing their experiences professionally as scientists, but also just as people. We have uh, a few questions planned that this conversation might go in all sorts of weird and wonderful directions. And we hope that you'll help us do that. If you have a question, um, a comment, a story, you wanna let us know how you're feeling today, please, any of that, you know, perhaps you are interested in becoming a scientist. Perhaps you're curious about some of the work that these scientists do. Or perhaps you yourself are a scientist and something resonates with you and you want to share your experiences. Again, please leave any of those questions, comments, thoughts. We really want to hear from you and connect you to our experts. Leave all of that in the YouTube comment section. Uh, so without further ado, we're going to welcome our first scientist. So please welcome to the live stream, Hallie Benesuti. She is a graduate student at the University of Washington in the Department of Biochemistry. Hi there, Hallie. How are you doing? Good, how are you, Dave? Yeah, good, thanks. I'd also like to welcome Kathy Flood, who is the Managing Director at Cascade Game Foundry. <laughs> hey, Kathy, you're right. <laughs> and finally, Dr. Ralph A. Cacho, who is a postdoctoral researcher at the Institute of Protein Design over at the University of Washington. Ralph, how are you doing? Pretty good, how are you? Yeah, great. Hi, everyone. <laughs> hello, hello, we're all here. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, my first question is just a basic one. Just briefly, maybe 60 seconds, if you could just tell everybody what it is that you currently do in STEM or, or maybe something that you've recently been doing with STEM. I'll start with uh, Hallie. Uh, you want to kick things off? Yeah, totally. Um, yeah, so like Dave said, I am a graduate student in the biochemistry department at the University of Washington. Um, and I'm doing my um, uh, doctoral research in a lab that studies uh, muscular dystrophy. And we're trying to work on developing uh, various different therapeutics for that. Um, so yeah, so I look at a lot of muscles and I yeah, get to make mice run on treadmills and do a bunch of exercise. So it's pretty cool stuff. Very cool. Kathy, how about you? Hi, uh, I'm a computer scientist and I make video games that help people understand and hopefully care about the environment. Brilliant. And Ralph, how about yourself? So uh, my uh, workplace is using a, a computer program called uh, Rosetta to design different uh, biological machines or proteins to do different uh, functions. Like uh, the one that's really pertinent today that uh, some of my coworkers are working on is uh, for vaccine development. So, and in my case, I'm uh, using uh, the uh, computer program to design proteins that can replace uh, chemical processes so we can make chemicals in a cleaner fashion. Very cool. Uh, well, thank you all for that. We're gonna shift gears a little bit. Well, now we know that what you all do now, my next question for everyone is, what did you want to be when you were eight years old? <laughs> so Hallie, I'll start back again with you. What, what, what were you wanting to do when, when you were little eight year old? Yeah, um, I think when I was eight years old, I wanted to be an interior decorator. Any, <laughs> okay. Yeah, Just really like random, but yeah, yeah. I wanted to get paid to decorate 
fancy people's houses. I thought that sounded like a lot of fun. So <laughs> I still think that sounds like fun. <laughs> You've got some very nice decorations next to you on that little window. Thank thing. you. Thanks. <laughs> Kathy, how about you? What did, what did you want to be when you write? Uh, when I was eight, I, my dad was a pilot. I wanted to be a pilot too. So I, uh, yeah, and he he and my mom both uh, encouraged us to study science. I eventually decided I liked being flown um, and being able to look out the window uh, more than I liked flying. So I went a different direction, and I was kind of the I was still a little absent-minded, and I was always a little concerned I would forget something like landing gear. <laughs> that sounds pretty. <laughs> Yeah, not a good place to make mistakes, huh? <laughs> well, cool, Science is a little more forgiving, I suppose. <laughs> yeah, uh, I guess in my case, uh, well, I didn't know when I was younger that uh, a scientist is uh, like an actual career that you get paid for. So I wanted to become a detective instead. And well, there's a little bit of overlap being like a detective and a scientist where you try to like investigate mysteries and try to answer questions. So very similar mindset, I guess. Yeah, definitely, uh, definitely trying to um, explore things that make you curious. Are there, are, are there what, what are things that make you guys curious, maybe outside of the world of science? Is there anything that, that you enjoy or that, that, that makes you curious? Is anything coming to mind for anyone? I don't want to put anyone on the spot. <laughs> oh. Well, part of, uh, I grew up out in the country, and so I was always um, fascinated by the creepy crawly things in the, in the grass and looking at the bugs and the animals and uh, wild animals. Um, when I got older and I started uh, swimming, then I wanted to know what was in the water. I wanted to stay down as long as I could. Uh, eventually became a scuba diver. Um, so, yeah, I just... Any, any, any sort of wildlife or things that you can't control, I just think that's always fascinated me. And Kathy, how has that translated into the work you do now? So uh, I make a scuba diving video game and VR experience right now. And my motivation for that was um, in part to, to share those amazing adventures that I'd had uh, learning about those animals with other people. A lot of people, most people don't get a chance to, to even get in the water, let alone learn anything about it. Um, and through a video game or VR, you can let them do that without getting, uh, without getting wet. Hopefully they'll be inspired to get wet and get in the water someday. Mm -hmm. um, but I've always wanted to share those experiences with, with other people. Um, so my focus in video games has almost always been reality-based stuff. I worked on sports games, football games, car racing, that type of thing. Um, so it's just a way to, to show somebody a part of the world, a slice of the world that they can't experience easily otherwise. Very cool. Ralph or Hallie, do you have any, uh, any, anything that, that, that you get curious about, that you've been curious about? Well, uh, I guess for me uh, recently, um, well, my friends are playing a lot of uh, Animal Crossing and they were <laughs> chatting about uh, turnip prices. And then like, I was really curious on like, how like, the turnip prices like, flop, uh, like, change and it kind of is reminiscent of like, like economic models. So I got really curious about, uh, on, on looking at like more of like uh, of uh, the economics in in different like video games, <laughs> and just try, yeah, just trying uh, to review a little bit more of my uh, uh, college uh, econ. How much does a turnip cost you these days on Animal Crossing? Do you know? I don't know. Like I, I like the I guess the interesting aspect of it is like I would hear like people like having like almost like like uh, like almost like a black market for like turnip. <laughs> And they would like have prices that are are not like the equilibrium price and like like the for the for the economy. <laughs> okay, Holly, do you have anything that comes to mind? Um, I really love plants, and I love foraging for edible plants outside. Um, so that's uh, yeah, that's been super fun. Since we haven't been able to you know get out a lot and everything with quarantine and stuff, I've been trying to show some extra love and care to my house plants and show that they're, yeah, make sure that they're doing well because they have not, they were not doing that well up until quarantine. <laughs> and I think now that I'm home more, I'm realizing like how well they weren't doing. 
Um, <laughs> so yeah, also got a few new ones too. So also introducing them to the family, and making sure they feel comfortable and at home, so. It's always nice to hear a, a little success story during COVID-19, the, the house yeah, right. <laughs> relishing it. It's the groundhog um, day thing. <laughs> yeah. Right? right? I'm trying to, I, I'm trying to practice a little more, trying to take care of things on the to-do list. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So that's quite a bit of uh, reading also. Like uh, I'm reading uh, Robinson uh, Crusoe and I'm thinking about reading uh, The Martian, which is like, yeah. <laughs> uh, that kind of uh, kind of reflects uh, what uh, everyone is going through right now. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so so speaking of COVID nineteen, um, how how have things changed for everyone um, with with the work that they're doing? Um, Ralph, should we start with you? How's, how, uh, how's sure. yeah? Uh, well, uh, protein design. So for my work, we used to do both uh, computational and uh, uh, and wet lab work. So all of us pretty much, uh, except for the people who are uh, dealing with uh, vaccine uh, development. Uh, so uh, every one of us, except those group of people are doing computational work uh, 100%. So uh, yeah, we have to go back and uh, review a lot of our uh, uh, computational knowledge, like for example, uh, a month ago there was uh, a Python bootcamp for uh, for the people who are using uh, our software package, and then we went through that training and just to uh, learn some more, more about uh, the computational means to design proteins. And I understand that there's been some pretty interesting. Um video games or kind of gamification okay. of protein design and especially around COVID-19. Could, could you explain what that is to folks? So in, uh, I believe that's with uh, the Folded. So, uh, so Folded is a game that uh, lets uh, players uh, design their own protein. And then in this case, what they're trying to design is uh, a small protein that can bind to the protein that recognizes uh, the uh, target protein in humans, so the, the spike protein. So uh, what uh, the, the game, like the level for the game is doing is they're trying to design something that can bind to the spike protein so that... Oh no, Ralph's frozen. Uh -oh. <laughs> no. You froze just at the end there, Ralph. You're, you're back now, oh. don't worry. <laughs> Sorry. Oh. Why don't we move on? Um, Kathy, how about yourself? Um, what, how, has, how has COVID-19 changed things for you? So in some ways it hasn't changed that much because we already worked from home. We made the decision with our tiny little company that we uh, wanted to work from home. Um, uh, from a financial standpoint, it makes more sense. From an environmental standpoint, it makes more sense. So it's interesting to see I, I hope this results in some changes for other companies recognizing that you don't need to have an office. I mean, the internet's there, you can kind of work from anywhere. So um, so in that way, it hasn't changed. Um, we've actually been, uh, we've gotten a lot of requests. We make our uh, scuba diving simulation game available free to teachers and schools. And so we've gotten a lot of um, requests for homeschool situations and we provide it for that too. And then, um, we're also, uh, we partner with some people in the scuba diving industry, the people who make masks and wetsuits and that type of stuff. And a lot of those small businesses, the dive shops have really been hurt by the fact that you can't go diving in the real world. So we've made uh, copies of the game um, or codes for, for the game available to them so they can reach out to their audiences. Maybe they can dive virtually if they can't go diving in the real world, just as a means of trying to, to keep um, interest in the, in the sport and in the environment um, front of mind while this is going on. So in that way, we've been um, a little bit busier, <laughs> which is a little strange. Uh, How many people work at your um, company, Kathy? Uh, four. Okay. Um, oh. But uh, yeah, we, <laughs> we, uh, we have side gigs too. So those are, uh, you know, it's, it's a small uh, labor of love, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah. And do people, so a lot of this is sort of commissioned then, or do you uh, like design a game? So for like the scuba shops, right? Are you designing a game and then 
pitching it to the scuba shop saying, hey, here's something you can do. Or did a scuba shop come to you and say, hey, we need. No, actually, uh, the, the, we, <clears throat> we build the game ourselves um, and okay. we build slowly. Uh, we built two different um, locations so far. So one in Micronesia, that's a World War II shipwreck. And a second one that's in Belize, it's a big open reef. And that site uh, came because we're working with uh, Sylvia Earle. And that's one of her favorite dive, so uh, dive spots. Um, and then the third one we're building is the Pacific Northwest uh, Puget Sound Salish Sea, which um, because we do a lot of school outreach and we've realized that so many people around here don't know anything about what's in their own waters. So we build the game. Um, we just made it uh, available for any of those dive shops. We just gave them code so they could download it. Um, we would love to build sites on commission. That would be super sweet. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's uh, everyone is kind of a, a, a new research project. So you have to research all of the, the wildlife was there, the, the conditions, um, what the history is, uh, what the environmental issues are. You unlock little little pages of information that tell you about the area and the wildlife in the game. So every one of them is kind of a, a long research project. Yeah, that's so cool though. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's been a lot of fun. So do you uh, take the live footages uh, from under the sea or how do you uh, get the, so uh, the internet makes things really easy. There's a lot of stuff that's available online. You can get um, uh, kind of the shape of the area through the USGS, um, mm -hmm. just free information. Um, we are divers ourselves, so we'll take some pictures. And then honestly, YouTube has tons and tons of stuff. And then we, we uh, through the, our contacts in the environmental world, we find people who are experts in those areas that can tell us about the distribution of the um, of the animals and the plants and um, uh, just different stories that are that are specific to a, a specific area so so as a like user of the game if you were swimming um, would the would you, there sort of be purposes to what you're doing of like you want to collect data on this specific animal or we want to get samples from this trench or what sort of the goal of each of the games then? So we're trying to make this like, uh, so to make it what real divers do. So real divers, um, I, I'd like to start doing the, um, the, the research where you lay out a, a, a map, a grid, and then do the surveys for uh, how, the, how the animals are doing and being able to identify um, disease. Uh, one of the stories around here that we tell is the, the sea star wasting. You know, why did that happen? And what can you do to help that? Uh, is there anything we can do to help that? If, um, but you learn a little bit about ocean acidification. And, um, but uh, as a diver in the, in the game currently, you can use a compass for navigation. Uh, you can go out and find and identify the wildlife in the area, um, take pictures. So uh, there's no, it, it's, um, it's more of a, an interactive documentary than it is a strict game. So um, we didn't, want to have you train the animals or do things that you really can't do. Yeah. That said, there are seals around here and they come up and they, they kind of hang around like puppy dogs. So <laughs> trying to, to, to have, have you have uh, the, the experiences that you would really have if you were a diver. So be surprised by the wildlife and hopefully learn something about it. Well, yeah. folks will definitely have to come and, and check that out when we're back open at Meet a Scientist <laughs> and, and Meet Kathy mm -hmm. and play it because it really is fun. Um, we have a, a, a first question from, from YouTube. So um, for the folks who are tuning in, if, if something sparks curiosity, or you want to ask a question, please do. This one is for Hallie. Uh, Hallie, do you really make mice run on treadmills? <laughs> How big is a mouse treadmill? Yeah, so um, yeah. So my lab studies uh, what I mentioned earlier, muscular dystrophy, which is a muscle wasting disease. And so what happens in humans that have this disease is as they get older, their muscles start to atrophy away um, and you just lose strength and there's no way to really counteract it. And that's what we're working on developing. So we actually have mice that have the same disease so that we can study what's happening in the mouse and then hopefully be able to figure out um, some sort of therapeutic for the mouse that then we could put into humans. 
Um, and one of the ways that we test that is endurance, right? Because if your muscles are becoming super weak and sort of wasting away, you're not gonna be able to run for very long on a treadmill. So we actually, we do have a mouse treadmill. Um, it's about two feet long um, and it's five, um, like, uh, there's different tracks, five different tracks on it side by side. So you can f have five mice running side by side on the treadmill at once. Um, and yeah, so we'll put the mice in there and then we'll kind of measure how long they can run at a specific speed until they start to get tired. And there's a little platform they can kind of rest on at the end of the treadmill if they don't want to run. Um, and so we can time out how long they run for and the diseased mice will run for a significantly shorter period of time than a healthy mouse will. Um, and then the mice that have received some sort of treatment usually end up running for about the same amount of time that a healthy mouse does. So that tells us that our um, therapeutic is working in terms of trying to get endurance back up for mice. Um, that's one of, we also have strength tests where we can sort of test how strong the mouse muscles are based off of how hard they pull on a, it's like a little metal grate and they grab onto it and you just pull them and it measures the force of that pull. Um, and so we can measure how strong they are in that sense. Um, we have another instrument that um, you put the mouse under anesthesia so they're unconscious, and then you use little electrodes to stimulate a muscle flexion. So in our case, we use their hind leg and we stimulate their foot to sort of do this sort of motion. And then we can measure how many times it can do that until it gets fatigued. Um, and that's based off of force too. There's a bunch of really cool instruments people have developed to try and figure out how strong a mouse is essentially. So, yeah. That sounds, uh, it sounds pretty wacky having a little, little gym for, for, your, for your lab, right? 1,000%, little dumbbells and barbells and kettlebells. <laughs> Do you have, uh, you have any videos of this? I'd love to see that. Um, you can find videos on YouTube. We, for legal reasons, unless you, you have to take a video with like very special permission to be able to show. But if you just look up mouse on a treadmill on YouTube or like um, the, the foot one is called like the um, hind limb torque test. There's videos of it. I've pulled videos off of YouTube to show in presentations before. Um, so there's definitely a lot of it on there. You can find anything on YouTube. <laughs> Do you happen to know how fast an average uh, mouse is? Like how fast? <laughs> yes. is? Oh my gosh, that's <laughs> an interesting question. Um, I don't know because I'm sure a mouse in the wild would run a lot faster than a mouse in the lab. The mice oh. in the lab are bred to be pretty mellow just because you don't want to, you, you don't want them to be super like nippy or hard to catch or something like that. Um, Plus they have really bad vision. So I can't imagine it would run super fast or super far, <laughs> but I'm sure in the wild there, I mean, if you see them like dart across the road or on a hiking trail or something, they always seem like they're really fast. So yeah. Very cool. I, don't, I, I really don't know that much about mice. I just deal with them a lot. <laughs> 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 So, I'll tell you about their muscle composition, but that's about where my knowledge ends. <laughs> when I remember you telling a, a story when we were in the fellowship about being fascinated with muscles when you were really mm -hmm. little. Yeah. Yeah. It's always been um, like a weird interest of mine um, from a super young age. I, I, my earliest memory that I have of really sort of going out of my way to learn about muscles was in probably like sixth fifth or sixth grade um and I just yeah I think I was I think it was like my mom is a runner and she would get this like runner's magazine every month and I th I think it was an article in there was talking about the muscles in your legs or something and then um I was yeah going into the library to read about muscles or um my family still had dial up then so it was like going onto the internet for <laughs> <laughs> for however long to learn about muscles and any magazine that came I was like pulling out like workouts and things like that and I just I don't know the way that they work in there um on a really tiny molecular level there are these I mean it's like every cell in our body it's a super intricate machine um but muscles to me just have this really wild mechanism um each muscle cell has like a little zipper inside of it so that it can contract and relax um and I just think there's something so cool about that. And then the fact that you can have a bunch of cells contracting and relaxing together. Um, and then the complexity of 
beyond just the cells itself, but like the number of muscles that you have in your body and that each muscle serves a specific function. And that because of that function, there's a, the composition of it is different, right? We have fast twitch muscles and slow twitch muscles. And depending on um, like which muscle you're looking at, the ratio of those changes um, because of the function of that muscle. So there's just so much like uh, specific specificity just within we think of like muscle as being sort of one tissue within the body or one organ um but then there's so much variation within that even and I I don't know if that's always been really fascinating to me so Hallie it sounds like your dad was 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 very influential for you um mm -hmm. Ralph did you have any 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 courses or any professors or any people who really inspired you to do what you do today uh, well, uh, I guess uh, my parents, uh, so my dad uh, used to be a petroleum engineer and then my mom used to be a nurse. So they're both in uh, STEM fields. And then when we were younger, they would uh, buy us books. And uh, uh, so there were only like, uh, so back when I was uh, younger, there were, there were only like three of us uh, with my, uh, so I have two other siblings back then. And then they bought us three different books. And then by chance, I ended up with the science book. And that kind of sparked my interest uh, in science. So yeah, uh, yeah, it just so happens that uh, the, the one that I was given is a science book and, and maybe that kind of uh, influence where, uh, where my interests are afterwards. But yeah. Um, and then for uh, high school, I, I, yeah, I guess I just got, uh, well, I gravitated towards uh, science a little bit more just because, uh, well, uh, I do better on it compared to like other subjects. And, um, and, and yeah, when I, uh, I guess uh, it, it uh, also for, uh, it, when I was in high school, I took uh, a lot of, uh, of uh, science, uh, honors classes or EP classes. So that kind of drove me towards a particular path. Kathy, how about you? Did you say me? Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, I, grew up, I grew up in Iowa and uh, went to, uh, in a, like in a little town, 3,200 people, um, right outside of Des Moines. And for whatever reason, I hit the jackpot on, uh, on science teachers. We had three amazing science teachers that were just they made it fascinating and I love how you talking about the mice I, I remember the mice that lived in our lab and um yeah we got to do uh we we got to take their appendix out in one class um and so we had to do the anesthesia and and, and bring them out of it and it was um yeah we just had really exceptional teachers who loved what they did some of them were uh we did some physics experience or experiments where we shot arrows way too high and they went through the roof of a building when they came down. Probably not the best. It made an impression on me. <laughs> um, but yeah, they, 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 they were just fascinating teachers who uh, made it a lot of fun to go learn things. Um, they taught us how to think. And I think that I take that with me even now. So, Kathy, your work is inspiring some comments. Uh, Sarah says, this is great, by the way. My mom would not let me play any video games growing up unless they're educational. So you're definitely filling that market. <laughs> it's, well, it's interesting. I mean, a lot of the, the, the big games out there are super violent, right? And a lot of the educational games don't have very good graphics. And so there's, there's I, I wish the investment that was made in, um, in creating the, the big budget violent games was some of that was devoted to more educational documentary style games. It seems uh, a lost opportunity. And you know, maybe that's changing. I hope it's changing. We're trying to set a good example for that. Mm Hallie, -hmm. how about you? Is there, is there any, I know you mentioned your dad, but was, was there anyone else who was influential and inspiring for you on your journey to get to where you are today? Yeah, my um, undergraduate advisor, um, who was the biochemistry professor, um, she and I just connected on an academic level, on a personal level. Um, we're still really good friends to this day, but she had always just had such a cool trajectory of um, 
after undergrad, she uh, worked in industry for a few years. She studied x-ray crystallography, um, then went and did her PhD. And I don't know, just the sort of her trajectory and then the teaching that she's doing now and stuff, it just really inspired me. I was like, I want to be like her. Um, and so that was sort of, that was why I decided to go to grad school. So, yeah. Yeah. So teachers, Kathy, like you were talking about the influence that your teachers have and it definitely like a, a good teacher can make all the difference for um, changing your mind about a field. And so it's really important that we have good STEM teachers too, so that we can, yeah, have more I, people who are interested in STEM. I ended up in computer science a little bit backwards. I didn't take computer science classes in my school because that was one teacher that I didn't really mm. like that much. Uh -huh. um, and I thought, I don't want to do that. Um, and then I, it was a college teacher. Um, as I was taking math and science classes, I took some computer science too. And it was just a great teacher, just made it super fun. Um, the, the teachers who love what they do, it just, it's, it's infectious. Mm -hmm. And if you're lucky enough to have those sorts of teachers around you, that it changes your whole life. Yeah, like uh, I guess it's a similar uh, case to me as well. When I started to do uh, research back in my undergrad, I got paired up with a with an amazing uh, 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 postdoc mentor, and so uh, we were studying how uh, different uh, fungi make uh, antibiotics and other uh, bioactive compounds. So uh, we kind of worked together because I'm a more uh, comfortable with chemistry and then he's more comfortable with microbiology and then we kind of uh we kind of uh uh, uh click well with one another and then that kind of uh sparked my interest as well in pursuing a, a phd degree well despite uh teachers best efforts we definitely all mess up uh can you share maybe some of the the, the funniest ways or some of the uh, most impactful ways that you've maybe messed up or you failed at something or you've goofed up um, and, and, and kind of what you, what you took from that experience because uh, science doesn't always go the way you expect it to. Is there anything popping to mind for anyone? Oh, how many ways have I screwed up? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the, I, the, I, one of the things I think that all the science teachers I've had have impressed upon me, uh, me is the, the need to fail. You have to fail. If you're not failing, you're not pushing yourself hard enough. Um, I've certainly learned that running my own small business. Um, uh, you get to make your own mistakes all day long. Uh, so, um, but you have to do that. And knowing what doesn't work is, is in some ways more important than knowing what does work. It'll push you in a, in a different direction than maybe you were going to go by default. Um, I mean, the whole scientific method is, is based around that. You've got to fail. And I think there's a little bit of a hesitancy now I see with some people where they only want to fail. And if somebody is only going to tell you how they succeeded, then run away because you don't know. You got to be able to, to fail and get back up again. <laughs> um, yeah, I, oh gosh, how many ways have I screwed up? <laughs> You're not alone, don't worry, Kathy. <laughs> um, I mean, uh, there's, uh, if you're working on, uh, on, computer science and video games everybody's seen a bug in a video game consider that that's what you see after many months of development years of development sometimes the the early versions you know you can have people flying and floating and doing all kinds of things that are that are crazy or um yeah you you break things a lot before you find things that work so i've got a whole video of screenshots of bad things that have happened in games that mostly we fixed before they got out, <laughs> but not always. <laughs> Nothing like getting the, the, the bug reported later that you missed. Yeah, okay. yeah. <laughs> yeah people will let you know, I, I assume in video oh, yeah. Games, no. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. <gasps> yeah, I'm with Kathy in that, yeah, I, they're, it's really pressed upon you that mistakes are good. Um, I have a hard time kind of thinking of like a good story to tell because I feel like every mistake that I make has led to something or like I've learned from it in some way. Um, yeah. Even if it's just like 
daily things of, oh, like I added too much of this reagent or something, but then it's the next time that I do that, I'm focused so much more on adding the right amount sort of thing. Um, and so, yeah, I think, I think it's just like science is riddled with mistakes, but that's exactly what you, what you learn from. So I don't, it's kind of hard to say if they even are mistakes because it's how you get answers too. And so many like cool scientific discoveries have come from accidents happening. So every time I mess something up, I'm like, oh, maybe I'm going to cure something cool with this. <laughs> <laughs> when I was first learning how to dive, I, uh, I, I had a, a ring that had a magnet on it. And I didn't know that it didn't occur to me that that would throw my compass off. And I accidentally ended up underneath a ferry at, at the Edmonds underwater park and had a policeman waiting for me when I got back to shore. Oh my God. Um, that is not a mistake I've ever oh. made again. <laughs> but as a diver, you, you know, you record every dive. How long were you down? How much weight did you have? What gear did you have? What did you see? Um, that one was, was a very notable entry. And like I said, I've never <laughs> made that mistake again. <laughs> mm -hmm. Ralph, do you have any funny fail stories for well, us? Well, we only have like, what, 45 minutes? So <laughs> I'm going to make it short. <laughs> so, uh, in, well, I guess in my case, uh, the ones that uh, pop up uh, recently is like, uh, same with Kathy, like fixing bugs uh, on your code. And uh, like, like fixing bugs or debugging just uh, is very ubiquitous. Like everyone goes through it. And so there's a phenomenon called uh, rubber docking where they would have like a stuffed toy or a rubber dock, like the, the programmers and they would talk to the rubber dock while they're trying to figure out what the problem is. And it, it's like uh, this thing that they would bounce off ideas uh, with. And then, uh, yeah, that's, that's how we, like especially now during quarantine, that's how uh, I do my debugging. I would talk to a stuffed toy or an inanimate object and ask them, oh, why is my code not working? I did this, I did this, how come? And then, yeah, when it's like, it's almost like uh, uh, it's a way to verbalize what you're trying to do. And it kind of feels different when you hear yourself verbalize the problem or say the problem versus just thinking or just like looking at it. Yeah, you don't, you know, they always say you don't know a, a subject well until you can teach it. Right. Mm -hmm. The people who teach it have to have different ways of looking at a problem. And so if you can just talk around it and talk around, it, eventually you can talk yourself into the, oh, that's what I missed. Ah, oh, OK. All right. All right. All right. We're getting some great comments. Uh, <laughs> a lot of folks are appreciative of, 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 of you guys taking the time to do this today. And, you know, especially for, for kids who are at home being homeschooled. Uh, one question for you, Ralph. Do you name your rubber ducks? Oh, uh, <laughs> do you have any? <laughs> not on. Oh well, I guess I have my old uh, like beer uh, up there in the <laughs> shelf. But no, I don't get reason. I don't really give them a name now. <laughs> like back in my uh, lab desk, I have this uh, kangaroo that I use as a rubber duck. Like okay. it doesn't oh, have to be a rubber duck. It could be. Uh, it doesn't have to be a rubber duck. It, it could be like a, a Lego figure or cool. like any other stuff though. So no, it doesn't have to be a duck. <laughs> okay. Well, we have, we have one question that says, I'm curious what role do you think free choice learning environments can play in inspiring kids and young people to pursue science? I'm gonna kind of flip that question back onto you guys and, and, and say, um, you know, the Pacific Science Center is one of those kind of free learning environments. What are some of your favorite uh, PACSI memories? I'll, uh, I'll start with Hallie, maybe. Yeah, yeah. Um, oh God, I love PacSci. Um, mm -hmm. I love the laser dome. I always think that that's just such a fun, cool, um, like a very uh, like visually stimulating and relaxing space to be in. Um, but I really, I think my my favorite thing at PacSci. Um, Ooh, this is a tough question. Yeah, um, the 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 tide pool is so cool. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think of like a specific memory that comes to mind. I may need to you may need to loop back around to me. <laughs> okay. Anyone else? Anything else coming to mind for anyone? 
I, I went to the Pacific Science Center, oh my gosh, it must have been 30 years ago with my grandparents. And my and they were in their 70s, 60s, 70s at the time. And my grandfather was was like a little kid and he had worked at Boeing and he'd been a ship's captain and he's you know just super smart, technical. And I remember him there, were, I don't know if it's still there, there was a big mirror um, yep, where, where, where you could like, stand there and have half your body there and go out like mm -hmm. this. And my grandfather was doing this <laughs> and going all crazy. And he went over to the, um, there, uh, there were some tubes where you could talk to somebody who was on the other side of the room or something. I mean, he went, he went from, from object to object through the entire museum, like he was 10 years old and just, and he got, and he was explaining the science of this and that. And, and my grandmother and I were, it was, it was another one of those things, just super infectious. He would just wanted to understand everything. He wanted to, to look at this. And there was a, you know, there was the big map of um, Seattle and the tides and stuff and how the, how the water works in that area. And he, he wanted to talk about that and taking a ship through the, uh, uh, the Straits of Wander Fuke and stuff like that. Anyway, it was it, it's just one of my favorite memories of it made me, you know, I was um, old enough that I was, you know, a little more reserved. And I'm like, I don't have to be like that. He's, you know, how old is he? And he, so now I try to approach that, approach um, museums in the same way. I tried to channel my grandfather. He just went in with all this energy and, and an open mind and he didn't care who was watching or what was going on. And it was such a good lesson for me to get about, oh, that's, this is not limited to, to little kids. This is something you can do your whole life. That is awesome. That's so great to hear. Kathy, that reminds me of um, last time I went to the Pacific Science Center, there was this older gentleman who was there by himself, same thing, just like having the time of his life. And it was really cool to see that, yeah, like anyone can be here, like, bouncing up and down on this platform or like <laughs> touching this or interacting yeah. with that. And it was really cool. Like not there with kids, like just there to have fun and enjoy it himself. And I just thought that that was so cool. Is there, there used to be a bicycle that you could uh, pedal to turn the lights on. Yeah. Yeah. There's I remember a, that one too. Yeah. That goes above the water. Yes. Scary. If you're uh, if you're scared yeah. of heights, it's not for everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Ralph, how about yourself? Yeah, I guess in my case, uh, uh, there's like two, uh, one would be uh, the Tinker Tank where you get to build your own like mini devices like from all the uh, crafts uh, supply. And yeah, it just, uh, it's almost like a, uh, like a sandbox for whatever you want to build. So you can explore uh, building like, I don't know, like Lego, uh, Lego figures or like a uh, origami or even uh a small uh, like robot. And yeah, that's uh, really exciting. Just uh, the experience of uh, building something uh, from uh, the things that you, uh, that you see around you. And then the second one would be um, the Meet, of, uh, Meet a Scientist event, just uh, talking to people and uh, sharing uh, science with, uh, with uh, little children. Like so getting, uh, uh, passing on the curiosity and uh, enthusiasm to uh, to a new audience. Yeah. Oh, and the butterfly yeah. habitat. I love the butterfly habitat. I love oh, going yeah. in there on a cold winter day where it's miserable and yucky outside and you go inside and you feel like it's summertime and these beautiful butterflies are, it's just, I could live in there. I could live in there. <laughs> Seattle in the winter time, that is a good remedy for sure. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we are pretty close to to the end now. So we'll just very briefly ask one final question to everyone. Um, we'll leave on this. So, so can you show us something or tell us something um, that's been helping you uh, keep cheery and happy and uh, uh, while, you're, while you've been at home quarantining? Is there something that you could show or that you could tell us about that's <laughs> that helped you get through these kind of trying times? <laughs> I've been having fun uh, with with yoga on YouTube. You know, just doing the free a yoga classes. Yogi or yoga instructor that's yeah, that been... yeah, that's been fun and and kind of just taking some time to just read and reflect. And it's it's like the whole planet said, "Okay, humans, you're screwing up. You need a timeout, <laughs> and you, you need to sit down and 
reevaluate. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to look at it that way. I guess I'm looking for the silver lining. But... That's great. Ralph, have you been up to anything or, or anything? So I'm one of those people who would uh, buy a lot of books and then I'll end up with like uh, a shelf full of unread books. So I've been doing a lot more reading <laughs> recently and uh, I'm trying to finish uh, SPQR by uh, Mary Beard. So it's about uh, the, uh, the ancient Romans and I'm halfway there, almost there. <laughs> Very cool. Ali, how about yourself? Um, well, I was going to show you my dog, but he's conked out on the couch right now. And if I move him, he'll get all cranky at me. Um, so house plants, that's been part of my <laughs> remedy right now. But yeah, I've been um, spending a lot more time um, playing with my dog and taking him on walks and stuff. And so he's been pretty stoked to have me around more, as yeah. I'm sure everyone's dogs are. I don't have a, a pet, but then uh, my uh, friends that I uh, meet through Zoom, like they they have pets and then like that's like the the highlight of our zoom uh meetings <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you gotta you gotta see the pets uh, uh, well thank you all so much for doing this we, we really do appreciate you um given the circumstances i'm happy that we can all connect and that you can connect with our audience too before we go i'm just going to shamelessly plug brewology tonight we're going to be uh meeting Dr. Rachel McKinney, who is a sensory scientist at Fremont Brewing. Uh, registration is required, so go online and check that out. And we're going to be getting pretty nerdy about beer, and that's going to be tonight at six. So I hope everyone can join us for that. <laughs> um, but in the meantime, thank you so much for joining us, and we'll be doing this again next week. So bye for now. Thanks. Be safe.